Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present um, and emerging. Welcome everyone. Um, thanks so much, Maggie, for joining us here today. Um, I just wanna let everyone know Sandy's just flown in from America and she's currently staying at the AIS halls of residence, hence the bed in the background, but um, it's not her bed at her home. So she doesn't really have much of an option um, at the moment. But yes, Maggie, thank you so much for joining us today. Really um, looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I do have two little children here. So this is the juggle. This is real time. So I just want to excuse myself if they um, jump in uh, ahead of time. So we're just going to run this session um, by firstly hearing about Sandy's journey. Um, I'll ask her some questions to prompt along the way. Um, and in the last 20 minutes will be a Q&A. So as questions come up throughout the event, the live event, if you could just pop them into the chat box and I'll moderate them uh, toward the end of the session. Uh, this session is also being recorded so that people can go back and have a look at it later. Um, and yeah, we might get a start. Sandy, thank you so much. We really appreciate having you. And um, yeah, can you just tell us a bit, a bit about where you come from, the transitioning and from playing into coaching and uh, yeah, just the start, tell us all. Yeah, yeah, no, well, number one, it's great to see you, Lauren, even though over the Zoom, and it's great to obviously, uh, you know, be on um, this Zoom tonight with everybody here, and, and hopefully I can answer questions at the end here, but uh, I was just thinking about this the other day, and, and someone had asked me about how long did I play, they, they're always saying, what do you prefer better, you know, playing or coaching, and, you know, I think it's just totally two different things, but um, I am going into my 18th year as a, as a coach, um, not all of them as a head coach, but I was an 18-year pro as a, a basketball player. So, um, you know, it's been a long journey, but a journey that I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, the highs, the lows, um, you know, it's uh, it's part, that's part of being an athlete. Um, but, you know, it's still, this is my passion and I'm, I'm very grateful that I get this opportunity to uh, coach in the best league in the world in the WNBA with the New York Liberty and, and also as the Australian Opals coach, um, which, you know, after re representing Australia for 17 years, it was, obviously it's a great honour. Um, but look, my journey from playing, it's, you know, I suppose as you get a little bit older and my body was breaking down and, you know, I had achieved so much that I wanted to achieve and, you know, I started thinking about, you know, what's next. I knew what was next, to be quite honest. This is what I've done my whole life. This is um, what I love doing. It's my the greatest passion. And so, but I knew I wanted to coach at the highest level. So, and that was obviously the WNBA. So, um, you know, the last few years, just to help me with that transition, my husband, Olaf Lang, which most people are familiar with, um, he was the, the head coach um, in, you know, many different teams. But I would just pick his brain. I used to watch the preparation that went into preparing a practice, preparing a game. Um, I used to ask him to help teach me how to use the sports code and, and how you draw up plays. So I started that journey a little bit before I stopped playing. Um, and then the process came about, okay, trying to find a job. And I retired after the 2000 Olympics, um, 2004 Olympics in Athens. And I was, I was a teammate of Lawrence. And we go way back. We've uh, had some really great times together playing all around the world. But um, I, I just started to reach out to some teams. And there was only two, two teams that were available at that time. And that was uh, the New York Liberty and the San Antonio Superstars, who are now the Las Vegas Aces, actually. And, you know, I just reached out to the coach and just stroke, just said, yeah, this is what I want to do. And uh, he had obviously coached against me in the WNBA and admired me as a player, but I'd never really spoken to him. So we just developed a relationship and we felt, you know, he said I was a great fit for him. And and that's really how the journey started. And I'm very grateful for Dan Hughes. He was the head coach of the San Antonio Silver Stars who gave me my first opportunity and gave the opportunity for me to grow. Um, I was on a very experienced staff. Uh, Dan had been coaching the WNBA for years and uh, my assistant along me is Brian Agler, and this is a coach that has, uh, he's won two WNBA championships and um, obviously coached Lauren for many, many years as well and has a great reputation. And, uh, you know, we lived in the same apartment building and we'd go for daily walks every day. And 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 really, he was, uh, 
he, he really helped my journey because we just talked basketball and, you know, I just retired as a player and you have all this knowledge and you've learned so, from so many different coaches. Um, but then just to have someone like that, just investing in the time in me and, and answering all the questions that I had, it certainly did help my transition into the coaching world. And, and, and I suppose I helped them because I was a, um, a player that had just retired and, and, and eyes of a player and then a female player um, at the highest level. Thanks, Meg. Um, so I guess you've covered a little bit around the technical skills, but I, from being an athlete into coaching, like how, like how did that happen? How, like in terms of the technical skills, so you mentioned the video cutting up tape, editing film, scouting. How did you, did you do any like technical training or did you just really sort of learn from all off and, and those coaches that you mentioned? Yeah, really didn't do any technical training like they have in Australia here. And it was just, you know, I suppose my technical training was my 18 years as a pro player. That was my technical training. And there is more about, you know, the finer details of being a coach. And yeah, that, I suppose, yeah, you know, going from a player, you're just worried about getting yourself physically and mentally ready in it. And as a coach, you're on the flip side. You're you're focused on all the players, getting them ready to play at their very best. And But I enjoyed that because it allowed me to be in the game that I love. Um, you know, I feel like I had a lot to give and I was in a program that, um, you know, Dan Hughes and uh, gave me the opportunity to be on court with players and, and sometimes you have to learn there, but he kind of threw me in really early and, you know, uh, talking in front of the players and players are only just competed against the year before, but it was, um, you know, it was really a smooth transition and, um, I was responsible of, of doing player personnel the first year until I got my the following year. They allowed me to do the full scout, which was, you know, breaking up the breaking up game film and, and showing what we need to do and formulating game plans, which I just loved. You know, the preparation I put into getting my body right and, you know, making all those shots. But I just fell in love with that part, just trying to how how can we win? Um, what do we need to do and to be, you know, to beat the opponent that's upcoming and you know, I think obviously with more experience that you got, I got more confident. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. You know, you know, you have the knowledge. I mean, especially if you've played for so long, but then how to explain it and simplify it um, so that the players understand and that they can just go out there and play, um, you know, to the best of their ability. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the sports code, which is that's what I've used um, really my whole career and fast draw, it was just, you know, practice practice I've practiced so much I've scouted so many games so I think the more you do something the better you get and um, you know there's always new tricks to to learn but Olaf was a great resource for me so if I if I got stuck at least I had someone that could uh, I could call it's like how do I do this how fix this because you know I wasn't the technical expert and he certainly was and that certainly you know just helped me to to help me to grow and and just had good people around me and I think that's a part of uh, why it makes the journey so special. Awesome. Um, did you have any other sort of mentors other than, other than Olaf and the, the male coaches that you had? Did you have, obviously you've been coached by females and during that time you had had Anne Donovan, Jan Sterling, um, some of those women, but were there any other females that you sort of looked up to um, in that transition period? Yeah, look, I, I think you, when you're going into coaching and that you get that asked that question a lot, like, you know, what do you take? Um, from your experiences and I had so many great coaches I can't even name them but um, you know I always look back where did I feel the most confident and and was able to play at the best and um, you know I started I was uh, my first year in the WNBA I had Nancy Lieberman Klein I met mean, you know she was her first year as a head coach but she allowed me to be to be you know the freedom to run the team and that was great I think Ann Donovan I certainly looked up to her I just um, just just her demeanor and and how she uh, she believed in you and I think that really goes a long way and because you know we're professional athletes but we're still human beings um, we're not always going to be great every single day and I just think she had this great demeanor about her but she knew her basketball as well um, you know Jan Sterling obviously had her for one 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 year too and Jan was you know I suppose when you're coming in you notice she was really careful of um, player management you know like I think in the younger days like we 
my first national coach, we trained three times a day. We, you know, have three week camps. And I think Jan brought in the player management thing, which is such so important today. You know, sports science is really important and we're tracking their numbers and their loads and all that um, to ensure that we're, you know, we're preparing athletes in the right way and not just more is better. And I think we, we, you know, it's more is not better. It's just, just been better training. And I think that's where I learned from Jan. Um, but, uh, you know, other female coaches, you know, and maybe some other assistant coaches that just given me a confidence. But, uh, they, you know, there's been, there's been a few. Carrie Graff was an assistant with the, the Opals. I think Jenny Cheeseman is someone I looked up to um, from the AIS days. She was my coach here at the AIS and, and where it really all started for me. But I suppose one of the greatest mentors for my whole career and as a player and a coach has been Adrian Hurley. And that goes way back to the very beginning of my first year in the uh, in the AIS. And, uh, you know, a country girl, a sugarcane farmer's daughter coming uh, to the big smoke, I suppose. Uh, Canberra, you wouldn't say it's that big, but it's bigger from where I came from. And, um, you know, I had, had achieved a lot. I, I was a good shooter. That's what I could practice. And um, up in Mackay and um, with the with the limited, you know, facilities that I had. My mum couldn't drive and my dad was always busy. So I just used to shoot outside. So that was one of my biggest strengths. But, you know, Adrian, I still made an Australian team from there. So anything is possible. I think I was very resilient and I was very fit. But I think Adrian Hurley, um, he gave me the belief that I could be, you know, play for Australia. And, and you know, they, you know, you always think you're not sure, but he gave, he just believed in me. And I think that goes a long way. And I think, um, I, I told him last year at the, the World Cup um, in Sydney and when I saw him, it's like how impactful he was on my career. And, and it wasn't just for those two years that I was with him. It was, it's was, it been um, until this very day. Like he, it's, it's funny how randomly he'll just email me and, and it'll uplift me and just remind you that, um, you know, we can all have tough days, but you just got to, if someone believes in you, that allows you to, um, to keep grinding and, and keep improving and to be the best you can. Awesome. Um, look, moving on a little bit, I guess you've coached some of um, the biggest personalities and the greatest athletes in the world. How, how have you learned to do that? I mean, I guess it happens over time, but I, and it, yeah, I, I just want to know, I think a lot of us would like to know how you deal with, you know, that. <laughs> oh, which personalities are you talking about? <laughs> no, it's... Uh... Me, not me. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were easy. <laughs> um, no, maybe, maybe back to 2004, we'll see, but you were a bit such a competitor. Look, look, I think I love coaching. I mean, you want to, I, I wanted to challenge myself and coach at the very best. So I'm coaching the very best players all around the world and everyone is different, but, you know, um, we all think differently and that's the great thing. So I think the most important thing for me as a coach is just building those relationships and trying to get to know the players and, and how they tick. Um, yes, yeah, some are more difficult, you know, they let you in a little bit more than others, but um, I think I've I've gotten you know better and better over the years, um, but I think obviously being a former former player helps me because um, you know I can get that respect. I've been there, done that. Obviously not at that capacity. I'm not a Lauren Jackson or a Diana Trussi, uh, you know, the Brianna Stewart kind of player. But you know I've been in their shoes before, and you know I, I know what it's like. I mean, and Lauren, I'll attest back to you. I mean, it's hard being one of the greatest players in the world because so much pressure comes with that. So I kind of like, I understand that. And then I'm, I'm like a sounding board and, um, you know, I just try and get to know them a little bit and I communicate with them. I think that's the most important thing. And because really in the end, I just want them to feel comfortable and have an environment. I think that's very important for me. And, and I know we've spoken a lot about in, especially from the 2022 and just the culture that we try and build an environment where everyone is appreciated and valued, but um, I what I try and do in every team is that I make the players um, determine the values of what kind of team we want to be and the behaviours that will be acceptable. And I think when you have those things in place, it, it allows you to hold them a little bit more accountable. Um, but in the end, really, um, it's the leaders of the group and, and forming a leadership group within your playing group. I think that's so important too because that, that, helps, that helps lead the group as well. Um, but look, you can't... I, winning is very hard at the highest level without great players. So I'll take a great player any single day, but most of them, they're all winners. So, you know, they you know, you have to pull their, pull their head in sometimes. And, and I, I have had some issues over the years and 
We don't need to go into more specific details. I think everybody knows that, but I do have a few rules now that I've, I've developed the last few years to be quite honest. And, and, you know, one of them, I just, I have a no dickhead rule now, um, which is like, there's no entitlement because that can really destroy everything that you're trying to build up in a team because no one person should be big, bigger than the team. And I've had to learn that. And I know in the past, you know, you're trying to make, um, you know, the best player, but I, I think it takes away from the whole team effort there. So that's a big thing for me. And like uh, another one of my rules that I put in is no negativity. It, that's one of my pet peeves, to be quite honest. Uh, there's so many negative people in this world and it just sucks the life at you. So I would encourage all coaches, like, to just get rid of the negative people in your life. Um, and it's hard because of social media and I get obviously my fair share of that as well. But, um, you know, I just try and make sure I have very positive people around me and and I don't like negativity in, in the, the locker room because it doesn't help. Um, to, to It's not a solution, you know, it's just the blaming and I don't like that. And, you know, next thing is respect. You can have respect for yourself and respect for the people around you. And I think everyone can enjoy the journey way, way better. And, and my last one is just being on time. Now, they're my rules. I mean, that's the rules I've put in. The values and the behaviours is all um, driven by players. It's not by me. I'm not a dictator because I think the buy-in comes by the players buying in and they're building the values and the culture and the environment that we want. And obviously it's me just, um, you know, putting the system, system in place that uh, adapts to um, the players that I have. You know, I don't play the same way every single team that I have because I don't have the same players. And um, but that's exciting because that, you know, it helps my evolution. I'm always trying to learn and be innovative and watching, you know, basketball all around the world to see what the trends are uh, leading to. But obviously trying to still stay in touch with what's best for the team that we have um, in front of uh, in front of me. And that's obviously the Opals and, and the New York Liberty at the moment. Thanks, Dave. Um, look, I mean, in reality, you kind of touched on it then, but you're not going to get along with everyone and you're not going to like everyone in a team. Well, players won't. You know, how do you deal with those personalities within a team? And I guess you sort of touched on it in terms of respecting one another. You don't have to like people, but you respect yeah. them. People would respect. But I guess just how do you deal with um, any kind of friction or sort of animosity within a team sort of environment, especially when you're already in there? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, look, and, and Loss, I think everyone, every coach on here, um, you ask any any coach, they, they, they confront that, yeah, hopefully not daily, because that would be really hard. It would take away of the joy of, of being in a, um, a team. But, yeah, you have issues at time, and sometimes it could be jealousy. Sometimes it's uh, they're not happy with their playing time. Sometimes they're not happy with their coach and um, or some situations. Sometimes it's a personal Thing that's happened off the court and they're not dealing with it well so it's for me I try and communicate with them and just see where they're at and just ask them like how can I help you um you know and and just like understanding and some if it isn't jealousy thing that's when I may actually you know that's because that's not right we, it's a team ball and I just try and communicate to them and um you know I think teamwork makes the dream work so you got to do things together uh, individuals don't win championships, uh, teams do. And and you just have to try and um, just reset them a little bit and bring them back. And that's why I try and spend as much as, uh, time as my culture. I spend way more time on my culture now than I had in the past because um, I've learned from the lessons when I didn't put enough time into it. And that's when I had the biggest issues, trying to deal with really problematic players, um, and it just, it, uh, you know, I wasted time on them when I should have been wasting, not wasting, putting all my, that time into the team. Um, so, you know, their experiences that you learn, uh, that's part of the journey of being a coach. And, you know, I, I, for sure, I'm, I'm certainly um, not perfect. Um, there's things, you know, I want to always continue to learn, but I always think I'm trying to be consistent and, and fair and, and honest. And, and, but it goes two ways. I'm always asking players for feedback. You know, what do you want more from me? Uh, and I think if you would make it, it's, you know, it's a mutual respect. So I think you get that. You can you can overcome any kind of obstacle, but sometimes if you can't, that player just has to move on, to be quite honest, or the coach, one or the other. Um, you know, there's and, and that happens. It's just a, a clash of personalities. But I try and communicate and um with the players as much as I can and and um you know, try and find a solution or how I can help to to get back to to the values and the behaviors that we want to live by. 
Great. Uh, you've been the head coach of the Australian team for a few ne- few years now. Um, how have you handled the highs and lows of the competition? And you sort of mentioned before around social media and having good people around you and stuff like that. But like in terms of social media and when things are going, you know, not to plan or whatever, how do you personally deal with it? Do you stay off social media? Have you got rules around that for yourself to protect yourself? Yeah, yeah, I think you have to. Uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, negativity, I told you I don't like it. Um, and, you know, it does affect me. I'm not going to like sit here and say it doesn't. It does affect me. I think, um, yeah, it's disappointing sometimes because no one really knows what you're going through and no one's in a part of your team. No one, you know, they don't know who's injured, not injured, who's uh you know, what's any kind of situations, the lack of preparation, the good preparation. I mean, people just making judgments, um, you know, and I th- I've actually, you know, it's kind of sad for them because I think if you if you talk negativity all the time, it's just a, what a, a, a really sad life that you're living because it's like, why can't we uplift people um, and being positive? And that's the kind of person that I am. And I'm not going to change yet. Uh, I keep learning. I'm learning every single day, and I'm um, and I hopefully just like I was as a player, and that's what I'll continue to do as a coach. But look, I try and stay off social media as I, as much as I can, especially through tournaments, because um, there is you know the good and the bad, you know, because they can love you one day and, and really hate you the next day, which I which is quite mind boggling. Um, but in the end, right, you know, the players, the coaches, the staff, everyone, we're trying to do our best. Um, and basketball, it's just so competitive. You know, any, you know, at the highest level, any team can win on any given day, including in the WNBA. You, you know, you've seen the, the worst team beat the first team um, because that's one game you can always, certainly always, um, you know, lose on. But, you know, so to stay on social media and, and just having a circle of friends, um, they're, they're the really that matters. I always want honest feedback. You know, I, I need that. I want that. I think everyone needs it. But you can it can be done in a very respectful way. And I think... Um, you know, I, like I said, I, social media, I try and stay off. Um, I beat myself up enough. I know, like, things where I could have done better. Um, and I own those mistakes, definitely. And, um, you know, but I try and focus, okay, what's the, the solution, you know, it, it, it quickly. If we've lost a game and um, for me it's more about, you know, I have a rule in place that I can be mad, I can be upset overnight and have trouble sleeping Um, but that next day I have to move on um, because it doesn't help anyone. If I'm still thinking about last night's game, um, I've got to, you've got to like learn and then you've got to move forward um, from it. And so uh, the players, and I think they'll attest to this, I don't get too high or too low. Like some coaches obviously get really, after a bad loss, they don't talk to their their players or, you know, they just do their own thing. Uh, They start yelling and all that. I'm more like, you know, hey, we're in this together. Okay, this is what we need to get better. Let's get back to this is our solution. And sometimes it's like, let's just relax, just go out there and play. We just had a bad game. You can have bad games. We had a bad game against Freds. You know, the moment was big for us. We had a bad game. Um, No one liked it. So, But I was really proud of the resiliency, how we just came back to work uh, the next day and the next day and the next day. And and it just, it it come back down to the resiliency and, and the values that we had instilled in this group to handle that adversity. And obviously, Lauren, you know, I mentioned that you were great for that too because you have been through so much of this and we weren't going to lose. And we just stayed together. And, and you know, after that game, a lot of people were talking negative, which, you know, we just told everyone just try and block it out. But um, it does affect me. Yeah, I'm human, but I try and stay off it. Um, I, I, will, I will be honest, after Tokyo, it was very difficult for me. But, you know, it's a, a, it was a journey I learned, but not everyone knows the story and they don't need to. And But, you know, it's like, well, okay, how am I going to get better? And um, the best thing for me after Tokyo is that I went back to WNBA. Uh, I was still coaching the Phoenix Mercury. You know, we went on a 10-game winning streak, streak. We ended up losing in the WNBA final in the fourth game. So, um, but you don't forget, but they're, they're all part of the journey. And I think those, even though as hard as they were, Loz, has... I think it makes me a better coach because it, it it reminds me of okay things I need to do better and and you know and be prepared better prepared for the next time. Absolutely. Um, well, sort of on that, I, like, what do you do for your mental health? And I mean, staying off social media obviously is one of those. But I mean, in off seasons, yeah. when you're sort of reflecting, when you're taking time to, I guess, 
move forward, you know, and evolve as a coach um, after those big events or things that haven't gone the way that you want them to go? What do you do um, for yourself to, yeah, to take care of yourself? Yeah, look, um, a few years ago, I think it's after Tokyo, um, I got connected with a coach and um, he was recently in Canberra. His name's Cody Royal and he coaches head coaches. And so he's my personal coach. So if anything, if I need to just call him and just to discuss things, he's been a head coach in AFL in, in Canada. So he wrote a, a great book uh, called Tough Stuff, if anyone wants to read that, uh, about his journey and the emotional um you know, the emotional uh, the toughness that they, he had to face in his career. And he's obviously much younger than me. But, you know, head coaches, until you're a head coach, you don't know what you go through. You know, people, assistants aspire and they should. I think everyone wants to be a head coach and should experience that. But it's, you're not just coaching a game. It's it's so much more than that. Um, you know, you're, you're the leader of a whole group of people and, um, you know, it's the relationship building, it's the, just the planning and, and, and managing staff and that, which I, I really enjoy, but it's just not that. But so Cody coaches me because, um, and we had a great conversation yesterday because it's like we put all this time and effort into the well-being of athletes, but do we do it to head coaches? No, we don't. But I think head coaches need it because it can be a very lonely sport um occupation if you don't have the right people around you um but for me like I just even though I've had some really tough ones I, I just you know the passion you know it's I've never ever thought of I can't do it um it's hard I have to take some time off at times but um you know having someone there that I can talk to and vent and discuss that helps having positive people around me my group becomes way smaller that certainly helps me um and you know they're having uh, people with a bit of humor uh, that can make me laugh. That certainly helps. Um, you know, I've got a few of them. and But then I had to remind myself as well as that I had to go back to um, focusing a little bit on myself and my well-being. Um, and that means working out because I don't take enough time for myself. I probably spend too much working um, and planning. But I had to like, like you know, not don't need to. Uh, less is a little bit more. You know, I think my, well, less is better you know, in that regard. So I had to make sure I was getting enough sleep and eating well. And now I've just been, uh, since the World Cup, I've been working out. And my goal for myself is to continue that during the next WNBA season because uh, it very it does get very intense. Um, but I think it, it just allows me to free my mind a little bit and have that time and, and you know, some meditation where I can just prepare me to, to handle whatever's thrown at me. But uh, for the most part, I handle it pretty well, to be quite honest, Lauren. But um, I'm, you know, I'm very honest when I when I do these podcasts because I'm not a I'm a superwoman either, and I do have feelings. Um, but um, you know, I'm always out there trying to do my very best, and I think um, that and that's as long as I know I'm doing my very best and I own the mistakes. That's all I can ask of myself. Yeah, and I think that's why we love hearing from you because you are so honest with your experiences and it's a really good thing because people need to learn that it's okay to be vulnerable because you have to be to get to where you need to be um, a lot of the time, especially for, for women, you know, that's how we operate. Um, I get the, the next one is family, the juggle, you know, and that's probably, that's a really hard one because you've got two kids now. Um how how has that been throughout your journey? I mean, especially when they were really young. Um, two two coaches, family. How's it go? Yeah, um, you know, it takes a lot of lot of hard work and dedication. To be quite honest, and 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 I would at times I um, haven't been as the best of that part either because of my pursuit of being a great head coach and a great coach. Uh, but I want to, you know, my uh, you know number one for me. Um, my husband always jokes about this, but, you know, it is my children. It is. They're the most important thing to me. Um, but I'm just very grateful that I get to my other, you know, I love coaching. I love basketball. I love being around it and I love being a leader. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that I'm allowed to do both, you know, and I have support obviously from my husband, but also from my teams that I'm a part of. That's a part of like, you know, I'm your coach, but my, te- my, my kids are going to be a part of this journey as well. So I'm very family friendly. And I think that's important in, in the women's game too, because some of my players have kids and, 
I'll have them around the court. And I think that's great because this is what we're doing. We're professional women, but we're also mothers, wives, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and it's great to have a supportive organisation. So I think that's really important. So I'm thankful for the people I've been around. Um, but look, I think one, one, one of my biggest mistakes in my coaching career is, is my very first head coaching job. Um, it was offered to me in the San Antonio Silver Stars and I was pregnant and with my second child. And I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity. I'm a superwoman. I can do this. I can manage it. I can do it. Not a problem. Well, hindsight, we we made the playoffs. You know, it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't, I, I can't even actually remember a lot of it, which is sad because that was my very first experience. Um, but I was so tired. I had a baby during the season. I had eight days off and came back and traveled for three months with three kids, two kids under three, doing everything. And I was exhausted. And, I, you know, it wasn't, I don't think I was great that year as a coach, but that learned too. And that's why I always say, like, you know, everyone wants to be a head coach, but don't go into a situation that's not the best for you because it won't work out. And that was that was one year. And then I only had a one-year contract and that was done. Um, but luckily I had another, you know, I had a pretty good reputation around the league and I got uh, I went back to assistant coaching in Los Angeles Sparks. Um, and then I got my next head coaching job at the, the Phoenix Phoenix Mercury and, um, you know, obviously and won a WNBA championship and, you know, had a pretty uh, successful time there. And, um, but, you know, they're things that you learn, you know, you think you can do it, but yeah, you know, my kids are important for me. I think there's times when, um, you know, I, I try to be there as much as I can, definitely, you know, I tried to make sure. And so there were some very late nights, you know, trying to spend time with the kids and then staying up late and, and, so I didn't, you know, it was a blur for five years, but I, I loved what I did. Um, I had really good people around me and my, my children were allowed to experience this journey with us. Uh, and during that time, um, my husband, Olaf Lang, and I, we coached um, in Russia with Ogebka. And this is a team, obviously, that has private planes and um, paid the best in the whole world. Um, and But it allowed us to, to hire a nanny and, and our children were allowed to travel around with us everywhere. So that was kind of special because that doesn't always happen in every organisation. Um, we could do that and they can enjoy the journey as well. And it's been a great, you know, it, it's just made them, you know, what a great uh, opportunity for them to experience so many different cultures and, and be around very just strong, um, wonderful women. And, and they just really took them under their wings. So, um, you know, there's at times, you know, my kids, I, I, I wish I had spent a little bit more time with them, but you're trying to get a scout done and, um, and that's areas where, you know, every year it's like I say, okay, I have to make sure I, I can give them more time. You know, it's, it's time. It's just, it's just a lack of time. But um, so we make it work. Obviously, my husband is a great support and we have great friends and family around us. I don't have family in America, so that made it hard. But um, we've been able to maintain this. And I think my, my kids are, are pretty special. And if you meet them, they're pretty uh, down to earth and um, worldly, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, last question from me before we take questions from uh, the crowd. Um, just about this season. So we're heading into the next WNBA season and you're literally going to be coaching one of the most star-studded teams that I think I've ever seen line up um, in the WNBA. Um, that's, I truly, like, that's my thing. I, I truly believe that. I want to know what your focus is heading into this season um, with the depth that you have, but, like, does that also put more pressure on you as a coach? Like, do you go in going, right, I've got this great team, we need to win the championship? Like, how? what's your mindset heading into this season and how are you going to deal with, I mean, you've sort of talked about how you deal with the personalities, but, like, yeah, what's your focus heading into this season? Yeah, look, I mean, number one, the, the people that don't know obviously follow WNBA, but we had a great off season. Um, you know, we were able to sign Brianna Stewart. Is you know, she's right up there in the Lauren Jackson, uh, you know, era. I mean, being one of the greatest players of all time. So very, you guys play very similar. So I can't, I really can't wait to to coach her and and um, but she's really she she's great. And, you know, I mean, she knows she's great, but she wants greatness. And that's like she wants to be coached. And uh, in our conversations, it's been really refreshing, um, you know, for a great player to say that. And 
Um, and Courtney Vandersloot, I think she's one of the best point guards uh, that we've seen in the world, uh, just with her passing ability. And then you, John Quayle Jones, who was two years ago, was the former MVP of the whole league. Um, so quite talented. And, you know, we just feel uh, very blessed that they've chosen our team to be a part of. And, um, you know, they they enjoyed the vision that we you know, obviously my GM and I had put together about what we envisioned for this team. And it's not, you know, of course it's winning championships and bringing, you know, be the first time a New York team has won one since 1973. So that would, that, that's our big goal, but um, we, we want to have sustainable success. We want to build a great organization that our team players want to come to. And um, yeah, so I have really great players, have returning players, Sabrina, Sabrina Inescu, I mean, Benazia Laney, you know, Marine Johannes, uh, Hansu, um, the list goes on, but what I, you know, what I mean, they're just really down to earth and they they want to win. Um, so we've talked about sacrifice. So everyone has to sacrifice a little bit of their game, but still play really well. Um, and, you know, as in terms of what I expect, what am I going to focus on? It's just being me. I'm not going to come in and be anything but who I am. And that's why, I mean, they're coming because of that. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to totally change who I am and, um players talk everyone knows about you know every other team and so you know focus on on the culture I've talked I talked what I do with the Opals and then and how I build up the culture there that's what we do I do with the WNBA teams and we'll be doing that and I've got some really special leaders there so I'm excited about that so certainly no dickheads so that certainly helps and um so and they want to win so you know you have to uh, and they're committed to excellence. So I'm just excited about that, um, to get that going. And, you know, for me, I can't wait. You know, we'll grow our game. I think the Las Vegas, I mean, they should be number one at the moment. They've got Candace Parker, Alicia Clark. I mean, you name it, they, they're pretty deep and they are the champions. Um, and they'll have more continuity than us. So it's all about us early. It's just getting the chemistry and 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 building building that on and off the court. And, and just taking it day by day, like I don't look forward. Yes, we want to win a championship. That's the ultimate goal. But we set little goals along the way of what we want to achieve. And that could be daily, um, individually and collectively, and that could be weekly. Um, and, you know, we'll just continue to to, to grow uh, um, with each other. And and I'm a, I'm a coach that, you know, I, this is what we're going to do. And then I'll say, you know, and I'm always asking for feedback. Hey, what do you think this would, you know, what do you think of this play? Or is there anything else you'd like to put in? So I think, um, like I said, I'm not a dictator. I think it's a, it's way more fun where everyone is involved in that. Um, but very excited for the season. And, and hopefully it'd be nice to win another championship, but it's hard. It's hard to win another championship. But I think now I'm, it's, it's, that's the goal. And we're going to work really hard to do that. And we're going to, um, you know, handle any kind of adversity that is thrown at us because we're not going to go and win every game. We know that. But, yeah, those games is where you learn the most. Um, and But just really excited to to work with this um, New York Liberty team this year. Yeah. No, it's going to be incredible. Um, and I, I know we all can't wait to see how the season goes for you. Thanks. Um, all right, we all might jump into some of these questions. We've got a few here, Sandy. So um, we'll start with the first one. Hey, Sandy, can you give us an example of your most challenging moment, your most rewarding moment in your playing career and your coaching career? Uh, playing most challenging, and you might have to repeat that because I'll probably forget if I get talking. But look, the, mo the most challenging was not uh, qualifying for the Barcelona Olympics um, in 1992 with the Opals. Um you know, we had a pre-Olympics, just really similar to what we do now. And only the top three went through. And, you know, we had China and Brazil and Czechoslovakia. They hadn't split then. And, and it came down to the last game. If we win, we would qualify first and qualify for the Olympics. If we lose, we're out. let qualify fourth. And, you know, we lost, ended up losing by three to four points, I believe. So, and then that was quite heartbreaking because everyone wants to go to Olympic Games. Um, the most rewarding for me as a player was uh, Sydney Olympics. I don't. There's nothing better than, you know, playing in front of your home crowd. And for me, just getting the opportunity to play in front of my mum and my dad and, and some of my siblings was really special. And to play with the great Lauren Jackson here and winning a silver medal for Opals was pretty um, was the highlight of my career there. And um, look, as a coach, most challenging was Tokyo. Um, you know, it, it was hard when in Australia none of these players could train. <laughs> So they hadn't played for six months. And if you're a coach and your players are not having rhythm and on the court and, and playing together, it was hard. So we had very limited preparation. And um, and that was, you know, and obviously we had 
the other issue that we had and um, it was just very disruptive and ultimately we didn't achieve our goals. So that was, you know, that was heartbreaking, but I, I certainly learned a lot from it. Um, and the most rewarding, you know, winning championships, you know, my first championship with the um, Phoenix Mercury in 2014 was pretty special, but, you know, you know, I have, I take great pride in, in um, putting the green and gold on. And even though I don't wear it as coach, um, I, you know, I'm very proud when, um, you know, in 2018, 22, uh, World Cup when we came away with the medals because um, they're not as easy as probably everyone thinks they are. Uh, you know, a lot of work and dedication goes into that. But, you know, for me, it, I've just really just loved the, the journey um, and even the highs and the lows because I just think it helps me um, to, te- to keep getting better. And but, but I particularly love the people that are around me. Um, you know, there's have wonderful, wonderful support staff and wonderful players. And, and like I said, the great uh, teamwork and, and the fun that we have and, um, you know, the competition that we have together. I think that's always special and always will be. Great. Thank you. Um, why do you think there has been a leadership, coach, mentor, et cetera, evolution with more focus on player appreciation, player coach relationships, empathy, et cetera? And what, what do you think would happen where would basketball be if that change didn't happen? A loaded question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think you're getting about like how it's all about relationships now, coach-player relationships and stuff like that. And, you know, back in the olden days, coaches didn't give you feedback. You know, back when I played, you didn't get feedback. You just had to try and work it out on yourself. You got selected or you didn't. You played or you didn't. You kind of just kind of knew your role. And I think that made us mentally tougher. I know it did me trying to work it out by yourself and and just kind of trying to work on your ply. But I think just the, you know, with the, uh, it's just uh, the evolution of the game. I think, you know, it's, you always say, how do we get the best out of players and, um, you know, and female players? But I say this is to male players too. It's like, and I think, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and we all say the same. It's like, it's building those relationships because you want to, you're going to war with the people for you for six months, eight months, you know, yearly cycles. Um, so building those relationships so that, you know, you can form those mutual respects and you kind of, I want players to know what I'm about, um, you know, and that they're, they're okay to ask questions. Like they're not nervous. So I want them to to enjoy the journey. It does, and, and enjoy doesn't mean it's easy because sometimes we have to enjoy the hard, enjoy the hard parts because that's how it makes us grow. Um, but look, I don't know what it would be like if the player coach relations hadn't changed to what they are now where, where, you know, there's more communication and honest communication, but I think, yeah, I think more people stay in the game, (laughs) you know, it's nice to know, um, you know, getting feedback, at least you can actually do something with that feedback than not knowing what you should be doing here or that, or just hearing it third person that, you know you're a terrible defender or something, (laughs) you're like, okay, well, how do I become a better defender? So I'm more about, you know, and when I give constructive criticism, I always talk about, I say something positive and then I give them the constructive. Now I do yell now and then, but I I, I don't make it a habit because it's just, you know, not my personality unless it's required. And and at times I do do that, but I try and just strike a, a, a good balance there. But this is me. I try to be my personality um, but I think everyone needs to be true to their true self. Awesome. Um, how and in what ways has your ability to review and reflect on coaching performance changed as you, oh, God, like changed as you gain more experience? Well, I know when I've messed up instantly, instantly, and uh, and, and I'll, like, so I won't swear on this, but like, be like, you know, I, I, I'm a coach. Like some are, they're thinkers, they're deep thinkers. I'm an instinctful person. I played the game. I see things happening before they are. Um, but you know, at times I, I have made the wrong decision, and but I own it. Like it's like it's not that I meant that to do that. Like it's just a bad decision. Um, because I'm certainly not perfect, and I, I tell my players that I demand. I do. De- like we chase perfection. And that's it. Like I, I always say, 
you know, I'm not, the players are not going to outwork me in that regard. So because, but so it's not that the effort and intent's not there. I'm trying, you know, everyone's trying to do their best. Um, but sometimes, you know, we do have a little values along the way and that's where we have to learn. And I think I'm really quick to acknowledging that, owning it, um, trying to let it go. Sometimes, yeah, trying to let it go because it does eat up at you. And I mean, for example, just it's really hard for me to eat during a tournament and um because of stress but i um you know i think i handle it well but i do i sometimes have stress and it's look it's way more stressful coaching australia than it is coaching the new york liberty it's, that's just how it is um and yeah i don't know i mean you know we all want to do well and everyone expects us to do well and and um you know want to you know want to please them but in the end you got to please the people that you're with and you know the people that support you the most and um, so that's always my goal, but you know, I'm going to keep learning and I try and look at different programs and I listen to a lot of podcasts and, and go watch different sports and, you know, how can we learn and, 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 and learning from each other, because it's funny when I talk to other head coaches, we go through the, all the same experiences, regardless of what the sport is. You know, you think you're, you're just totally alone. You're not, you're going through the same things. And so just getting a really good support group around you, I think that's great. And I'm in a leadership group at the moment with I really enjoy and people that I can lean on. And that's important. Awesome. Uh, if you could give yourself as a first-time coach some advice with the knowledge and experience you've amassed now, what are the top three things you tell yourself to focus on? Thank you. Also from Edward, I think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a great question. Wow. Um, yeah, I, sp I suppose, you know, as a first time head coach, what I've learned from is um, if there, if you sense anything going on in the team, confront it early. Don't let it fester. You know, when I was first in the young coach, I'd be like, oh, you know, is that, but I should, you know, have those community, ha have that conversations earlier. Um, and, you know, probably holding players, um, you know, if something's not, even if it's your best player, being able to hold them accountable, a little bit more like, you know, you got to treat, you got like, you have to be fair. And, you know, and I'm not always perfect at that. You know, your best players have a little bit of a longer leash, just how it is, you know, um, and not always fair, but it is how it is, but you still need to hold them accountable and, you um, and, you know, and not let it affect everybody else. I think that's always important here. And, you know, I think as you get older, um, you know, as, with more experience, you kind of understand the game a little bit more. And but that's still, you know, at, from a first year head coach and till, 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 you know, I'm 18 years now. But, um, you know, you just know the game. The more you do it, the better you get. But you always can get better. That's And that's the, I think that's the beautiful challenge. So, um Keep getting better. There's always different situations you can learn from. Um, but in, in, in the end, I always say believe in yourself. And that's what I did in the end. It's like, you know, I believe in myself. People may think otherwise, but I'm going to believe in myself. I think I'm, a, you know, I think I'm a, a really good coach. Um, I think I have great relationships. I think I'm respected. Um, and but, you know, keep learning, keep being, keep learning. Yeah, don't don't do what you did 10 years ago because it doesn't actually always work here. You've got to keep evolving as a coach um and, and learning and learning from others great thank you for that um do you find your coaching behaviors change in the league environment of the WNBA where there's a season worth of games compared to a tournament style um such as the opals like worlds or olympics yeah look I really my coaching style doesn't change at all really not not too much at all I mean I have to adapt to the players that I have but um I suppose I am um I, I probably I don't yell at the refs a lot because I find it just if I'm yelling at the refs all the time it means I'm not focused on what we're doing and you know I kind of zig something good at that now I, I will but I probably still yell at the refs a little bit more in a WNBA because you're allowed to um, whereas in FIBA you can't because you're going to get a real quick tech um, so I, I, I try and stay a little bit poised there but I am I know people say I, I, I like you know I don't just stand there I suppose I, I'm probably pretty engaged in in both leagues quite honest um and but I I just I don't like I don't see anything else of that that's all I'm focused on at the moment so I don't really uh yeah really 
focus on what I'm doing and but I just try and stay calm and yeah collective and you know hopefully um you know not make too many mistakes and do the best I can <laughs> you do good you do great just so you know just so you know um a quality coach we sort of touched on this during the the first part but uh quality coach athlete relationship does not happen instantly instead it needs to develop over time how do you go about investing your time and resources to do this particularly I just want to add this part particularly when you do have such a short time with athletes um leading into world cups or olympics or um even WBA seasons yeah look I think the important thing for me once you know um Mom, I'm pretty busy. People say it's just X's and O's and all that. You know, as a head coach, I coach two teams. I try and stay connected to all the players. And whether it's by text or reaching out and having a phone call and just checking in. Um, you know, I think I, I, sh I try and show the players that I care for them and um, and building those relationships and, and just, you know, meeting them if they're overseas. You know, some players are over in Europe, so... I, you know, reach out to them and just checking in to see how they're going, anything that they need. Um, so those relationships are built, like, even before the season, before you get in. Um, you know, obviously, we used to have a lot of Zooms with the Opals, so that's how we kind of done that. But I think you need a lot of one-on-one -on -one too. They need that connection with the, the coach one-on-one. -on -one. And, yeah, I, I'm just really authentic and real, and that's what I want my players. I want them to feel comfortable um, and uh, no, once we go on the on the court, you know, that's, you know, I'm the coach here, but I can push them because I know that I care for them as well. Um, but, you know, I always have, you know, communication. I'm always trying to talk to as many players as I could um, while they're stretching or and, and making sure I get around the room. It's not, I don't go to every, the same player every single day. I'm making sure I know who did I talk to today. And if I haven't spoken to them, I've got to get to them either at the end of practice or or the next day or or doing dinner or something like that. Um, it just takes time. You have to be invested in that. And it's all a, like, like I said, coach, head coaching is not just about rocking up and coaching a game. It's so much more than that. And, and building those relationships take time. But if you can invest in those relationships, I think it will pay off in the long term. Thanks, Meg. There's actually a lot of people just sort of saying thank you very much for taking the time to jump on. Um, Quick one, there's a lot of young talent coming through, a lot, a lot of Aussie young talent coming through. Who is someone that's caught your eye? Oh, so many. I mean, uh, I, mean I think everyone would have seen the Opals. I put um, a, 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 an extended squad out with, um, you know, Nards. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to say her last name real well. Pooch, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so I think Shanice Swan. Um, you saw what she did at the end of the year. I'm really excited to have her in camp for a few days. Um, you know, I think Tiana's back, Tiana Manga Kalia. So I think she's back to where um, she was before, you know, she um, had breast cancer. Um, but, yeah, so many players. You know, Steph Reed gets better. I'm, I'm really excited about Izzy Isabel Borlase. Um, you know, and, you know, at the moment I've actually bought in um, I've invited some of the COE kids just to get them enmeshed into the Opals culture and, and to get a look. So, you know, Jess Petrie and uh, either Juffersmans, uh, Sarah Portlock and, and Jada Clark will be joining the Opals camp this week. So really excited about that and just getting to know them. I've just had dinner at the, the residence with them and, um, you know, that's it, building those relationships before they get there. And, and they feel comfortable, you know, around me. And that's what I want them to, you know. I know, you know, back in the day, it's like, I mean, I, God, talking to the head coach was scary. Um, never very rarely did it um, but I don't do that I, I'm very personable and and so you know because it's it's really it's a game and, and you got to enjoy what you're doing um, and I want them to come in and feel not so nervous um, but yeah we've got a lot of young talent but you know I think Ezzy Mbegor she'll continue to grow you know Alana Smith's just come off a really solid year or well, she's still finishing off over in Poland but you know the future's bright I mean we still you know, but any kind of team, you need a really good balance. You know, we'll always pick what we think is the best team, and that may not always be the best players. Uh, people have uh, judgment on that, what who should be in the team, because um, sometimes you have to fill out the group with who complements each other. What do you need in those 11th and 12th player spots? Uh, that, that's critical, especially in national teams. Um, I found that, but you need a good balance, obviously. You need your experienced players as well that have been there, because going into major tournaments, um, 
there's you know everyone is feeling the pressure there and you want to you have to having been through it before it just um you know that experience certainly helps in those big moments awesome um and also georgia and more over in ncaa final four now she's gonna be she is yeah she's won um yeah, she is absolutely yeah, I'm excited about her. Hopefully I can get her back into a, an Opals camp. Um, I'm not sure if she's going to stay in college or not, but um, it's great. You know, it's it, Final Four, it's, she's, she's smashed it. And it's great, Jazz Shelley. We've got a lot of talented young Australian players over in, in the university. Um, so, you know, hopefully they'll all come back to the WNBL and it's, it's going to be, well, it's going to con continue to get better and better, the, the standard. Okay, I've got one more question here. Um, as a mentor, coach or lighthouse figure, what is the best way to maintain equal and deliberate relationships with people that you may not relate with as much as others? And we also sort of touched on that earlier as well, but if you want to give some points on yeah. that. Yeah, look, and, and the thing is um, you can just be consistent. Um, look, there's some athletes that I was really hard for me to connect to you know, for, you know, different, but I just, I just try and find a way what's a common thing that we have. And usually it's basketball, but I try and find a little bit more about them. And I think it's just showing them that you care because not all that I probably haven't experienced coaches that are like that. Um, so it's just a breaking down of the walls and being consistent in, in your communication with them. Um, but sometimes, you know, they're all different. You can't force anyone to, to open up if they're not ready. So, you, but you have to always be there for when they are. Um, and to su support them for whatever they need. Um, and, and that's what we do and like on all their teams. And it's not just me. I always ask the assistants, you know, that's how it's the building those connections is so important. Um, and we can build that trust because the more we can trust each other, the more that, you know, we have belief and we can go to work, but we're, we're okay. We can be vulnerable. You know, you have to build a space where this is your, I always say this is our, our space to be vulnerable because we are a team and, you know, and we're in it together. So um, if we need, if something's, you know, an issue, we have to make sure we're putting it out there. And, you know, but some, you know, in some place, it hasn't been many over my career, but there's been some places it's been harder for me to connect. So I just try and try and find opportunities one-on-one -on -one where I can just, uh, you know, get to spend some time with them and, and hopefully we can break down those walls, but um, we just always be there. That's what would be my biggest thing to, to say, just always be there for them and show them that you care. Oh, well, look, so we've run out of time. Um, thank you so much for taking this hour to talk to us and give us some insights. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, information that um, can definitely be used and taken from this. Um, coaching definitely is not something that I ever want to do because it's so hard and managing personalities. But I feel like as, as a friend and someone that's also played under you, I think that you do a incredible job and um thank you for supporting she groups and and working with us we really appreciate it mm. well thanks for having me lauren you're doing a great such a great thing with she hoops and um and thank you for all the coaches obviously that came on and and always anyone can is always free to, to um reach out to me i'm uh i try and pass it forward i think that's so important and you know i think you know, coaches need to support coaches as much as we can and, and, and especially females need to keep supporting each other too so we can keep getting more and more coaches out there. Awesome. All right. Um, that will draw this session to an end. Uh, we will be sending out a survey at the end um, of this. So if you could fill it in and just give us your feedback, that would be fantastic, um, especially on things that you want to hear and you would like to see and we can try and make that work. Um, also, there's another session coming up next Tuesday lunchtime with Karen Bryant, who's a CEO and GM of Los Angeles Sparks and previous CEO of Seattle Storm. So um, anyway, we look forward to seeing you soon. Sandy, thank you so much again. And yes, have a great night, everyone.